makes you wait. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Lewis has just talked about why we want to call variants in cohorts, and now I'm going to tell you about exactly how the variant calling and joint genotyping step works. So we are here. Oh, oops. Here we go. Okay, we. Oh, are here in the um, in the best practices pipeline, uh, right after. Data pre-processing, we have our analysis ready reads, and we are ready to variant call. So what's the purpose of variant calling? The reason we need algorithms to do variant calling is because sequencers produce a lot of data that's really noisy. And so here in this IGV screenshot, you can see there seem to be a lot of different mutations here, but we don't know whether it's really machine artifact or if it's a real variant. So GHEK, our um, recommended variant caller, is the haplotype caller. It replaces Unified Genotyper, which was our original variant caller. Uh, Unified Genotyper was a locus-based caller, but uh, it turns out that haplotype caller, which is a local reassembly algorithm, is a lot more accurate compared to locus-based callers. And we also have this reference confidence model, which um, Lewis touched on a little bit. And the reference confidence model is what enables us to do joint discovery really fast. So here's the method for haplotype color. We have four main steps. The first is identifying active regions. The second is assembling plausible haplotypes. The third is determining per read likelihoods of those haplotypes using a pair HMM. And the fourth step is to genotype the sample. So why do we have all of these steps? You can see in this IGV screenshot that this is NA12878 uh, original read data in this region. And it looks like there's a lot of SNPs and maybe an insertion and some deletions. However, after reassembly, you find out that there's actually a very large indel here. And this has been validated. Uh, if you hadn't done the reassembly step, you would have just called a bunch of false positive SNPs and potentially some insertions and deletions. So the first step is ident identifying active regions. Active regions are regions where there's potential variation from the reference genome. And the way we find out where active regions is by using a sliding window across the reference genome. And we count up where all the mismatches, indels, and soft clips are, and we keep a measure of entropy of that. And if it crosses a threshold, it triggers an active region. And those are the regions where haplotype color proceeds and works on. So the next step is to assemble plausible haplotypes of the active regions. And the way we assemble plausible haplotypes of the active regions is by doing this local reassembly by using a graph. This is an example of um, a De Bruyne graph-like assembly step. So what we have is a bunch of reads that are aligned to our reference genome. And what happens is we chop up all of those reads into k-mers. These are potential k-mers here. And then we create a graph out of all of those k-mers. And what happens is, these k-mers, these blue bars are the k-mers, and the graph contains edges. So where k-mers overlap is where an edge is. So for example, this might be one k-mer, and you can see that it overlaps with this k-mer, this k-mer, and this k-mer as well. And the edges are weighted with how many reads support that overlap. And we get our haplotypes by traversing the graph. So for a more concrete example, let's say this is our graph here. We can see that we have potential variation here, here, and here. And I told you that the graph also is, um, the edges are labeled with how many reads support each of the edges. So there is something called a min pruning parameter. And the reason we have this is because if some of the edges don't have enough read support, you want to just get rid of those. So let's say in this example, we have maybe min pruning three. This edge might have only two reads that support that edge. So that would get pruned out. So then we'd be left with 
this as a variation site and this as a variation site. And uh, you can see here that our potential haplotypes might have ATA, ATG, CTA, or CTG as their variation sites. And people want to know often what the, um, what the realignment step looks like and what the reads look like after realignment. And the way you can see that is by using the BAM out parameter. So if you use this, if you give a um, file name as your BAM file, it'll come out and it'll have the um, realigned reads. And you can compare that to the original BAM file. And then once we've traversed the graph to get our most likely haplotypes, we align the haplotypes to the reference using the Smith-Waterman algorithm. And so out of this step, we end up with our most likely haplotypes and the candidate variant sites. Again, the reason for reassembly is we want to eliminate false positives. And here's another example of how reassembly works. In this original BAM file, you can see it looks like there might be an insertion and a SNP, and then another potential SNP here and an insertion. So without reassembly, you see you call one, one multi-allelic SNP and two one base pair indels. However, after reassembly, you can really see that from a TT, it's a complex substitution to a TAC. Okay. So now that we have assembled our plausible haplotypes, we need to determine the, um, the per-read likelihoods using a pair HMM. So using a pair HMM, we get the likelihood of the haplotype given the reads. Here's what a pair HMM looks like, and I'm not going to go into the math too much behind it, but you need to know that the output of this is the likelihoods of the haplotypes given the reads. And we store all of these likelihoods in a matrix that looks something like this, the haplotypes given all of the reads. And the last step is we need to genotype each sample. So genotyping the sample has two parts to it. The first is we need to get the likelihoods of the alleles given the reads, and then we need to apply those into this big Bayesian model. So, how do we get the likelihoods of the alleles given the reads? Remember from the pair HMM step, we have the likelihoods of the haplotypes given the reads. And the way we get the alleles given the reads likelihoods is we take the highest probability of the haplotypes given the reads that contain the allele for each variant position. So for example here, we might have this as our reference and we've got three haplotypes. And then let's just say we have three reads. So these are all made up numbers and just for demonstration purposes, but let's say we're trying to genotype this position right here. You can see that we have two possible alleles, T and a gap, and then to get the likelihoods of the alleles given the reads, we simply take the highest probability of the haplotype that has the allele and put it into this table. So let's say we're trying to get the um, probability of gap given read one. We see that haplotype one and haplotype three have a gap. So we go to our table, haplotype one and haplotype three, and which one has the higher um, probability? It's haplotype three. So we insert 0.04 here. And then for allele T, we can see that the reference and haplotype two have T. So we go to our table, reference and haplotype two, 0 0.03 is the higher one, so we insert that here. Okay, and then all we have to do is plug in the numbers into this Bayesian formula. I don't know if any of you really like Bayesian statistics. I mean, I do, but some really simple overview of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to assign a genotype to each site, and the way we do this is we find the probability of each genotype given the data, the data's our reads, and so pretty much plugging in all of these values from here, all you have to do is find what the highest probability genotype is and you assign that genotype to the site. Okay, and the bonus perk of calling haplotypes is you get free physical phasing. So, here you can see uh, phasing. Phasing is 
you can see that these two SNPs occur both together. And also these, um, there's an insertion here and there's a SNP here. And you can see that they only occur apart from each other. So this only occurs when this doesn't occur. So we have um, two sample level annotations. PID is the phase identifier and PGT is the um, phase genotype. So PID, um, let's see here, it gives you like the number and an ID for it. And if you see this, you know that it's phased with something else. And also uh, the pipe instead of O. Oh, our normal genotypes have zero slash one. However, if it's phased, you'll see this pipe here. Okay, so all of those four original steps that I just walked through are for a single sample. But we just learned that it's better to call variants in cohorts. So for multiple sample analysis, we need something more. And that's why we developed the ref reference confidence model. Um, this gives us the likelihoods of all possible genotypes at all sites. And so the way it works is we run through all of these steps and what comes out originally from normal haplotype color is the variant sites. But in reference confidence model, we assign a genotype and a likelihood for all of the genotypes um, for all of the non-variant sites as well. And then we run joint genotyping, which is done with some really fancy Bayesian math um, that's for multiple sample analysis. Okay, so the protocol for running joint genotyping and joint variant calling. First, we run haplotype caller in reference confidence mode, and then we perform joint, genotype on the, joint genotyping on the cohort by using genotype GVCS. So we're gonna start with an analysis-ready BAM file for one sample, and we're gonna end up with a raw GVCF file for one sample. And we're gonna run haplotype color in co reference confidence mode. Uh, the command, basic command is java-jar genome analysis toolkit.jar. Uh, the tool is haplotype color, reference your input BAM file, and your output is gonna be a .g.vcf file. Um, it does have to be a .vcf file, even though it's a gvcf, um, it is a form of a vcf. And these are the reference confidence parameters. Uh, dash ERC stands for emit reference confidence, uh, GVCF. And then these two parameters are actually gonna be done away with soon in the next version, which is really nice, but they do um, have to do with file compression. Uh, oh, and the ERC mode is also available in base pair resolution. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a couple slides. So now we have a raw GVCF file. Uh, oh, first, um, so you're going to run haplotype color in reference confidence mode for each sample that you have, and then you're going to end up with raw, one raw GVCF for each sample that you have, and then you're going to run genotype GVCFs on all of the GVCFs. Okay, so what's a GVCF? This slide shows you um, a regular VCF compared with a GVCF in base pair resolution. Uh, a regular VCF only has variant site records, However, a GVCF has the variant site records as well as non-variant block records. So as Lewis um, pointed out, you have blocks that are non-variant and they're grouped based on their genotype quality. However, if you do want a record for all possible sites, you can use base pair resolution and that will give you a record for every single site, not group. They won't block off all of the um, reference sites. Okay, so here's an example of a GVCF. Uh, the main difference is that for, ref for home ref calls, it does include uh, a new or alternate allele called non-ref. And non-ref just stands for all of the um, potentially non-called alternate alleles. And you can see here that um, this is what a block looks like. It'll tell you the start position and then the ending position. And you can see this is the reference and your non-ref. And it also gives you all the site level annotations that you want, the genotype, and also your PLs. The PL is what gives you the confidence in all of the genotypes.
Okay, so now that we have all of our raw GVCF files from all of our samples, we can run genotype GVCFs to end up with a final VCF. So genotype GVCFs, uh, the basic command is java-jar GATK, uh, the tool genotype GVCFs, your input reference, and dash V stands for a variant, and you'll just input all of your GVCFs and your output will be an output VCF with all of your samples. Uh, we do recommend if you have more than 200 samples to run combined GVCFs, to combine those GVCFs first and then run genotype GVCFs. Good, so now you have your raw VCF file with all of your samples. So for results, you want to know how did the mutation calling work, and unfortunately, you're going to have to do some more processing to uh, filter out false positives. We do set haplotype color to be very sensitive so it doesn't miss any potential variation. Uh, but the next downstream step is variant quality score recalibration, which Bertrand will tell you about, and that will help you to filter out any false positives. Further reading. Questions? Ah, so the set window, the default is 250, but you can change it to, um, to be smaller or larger. It has to be at least 50, but you can set it to be longer or shorter. And also uh, for setting the, the size of the active region window, right? Yes. Um, the, ultimately, the program kind of adjusts the size um, a little bit. Uh, once, so once you've done the measure of entropy, there's that fixed default value. Um, what I mean to say is that uh, once the program moves ahead with that region, once it's decided it's active, it will do some additional uh, like di dynamic resizing to make sure that it has everything that's relevant, but not more than that. So there's a bit of dynamic resizing kind of before going on to the next step. Other questions? <clears throat> 